Today I'm going to talk about how patients can partner with industry to accelerate clinical trials. Why is it that we're talking about patient inclusivity today? Um, I think this field has been talked about for about 10 years, but a review of what's been going on would suggest that it's never really gotten past the pilot stage at most enterprises. Um, but that's coming up against increasing consumer expectations. People now can order things online, they can stream media whenever they want to, they can use their smartphones for all sorts of things. And yet, if they're a participant in a clinical trial, which is meant to be one of the most innovative things we can do, they're stuck with 20th century systems and they're agitated for change. We've probably reached a tipping point because there's enough experience now under the belt of, of sponsors, of uh, academic partners, uh, of non-profits to say, okay, so we've brought patient stakeholders to meetings, uh, we've had them influence one or two protocols, but how do we start to make this business as usual? And so I think that uh, CROs uh, are in a key role because of course they oversee and, and do the operations on thousands of trials all in real time, whereas uh, in the past we may have to have a sponsor that's got a problem with recruitment and they're in rescue mode and they're now saying, you know, many years into the process, let's go get a patient's view on this. So ideally what patient inclusivity or engagement should look like is actually um, co-producing decisions with patients as partners. So if you're just bringing patients into the room, listening to them and then ignoring them, that's merely tokenism. Even if you're taking 50 of their suggestions and only taking one of them, that's just placation. Really, I think what we need to do is to say, well, where are there places where we could actually maybe even delegate some power to patients, maybe even give them some responsibility? And so there have been some examples like the iSpy2 uh, trial in breast cancer, where uh, patient advocates themselves, uh, women living with breast cancer, were put in charge of the cultural translation of some of the informed consent documents. And so obviously that lived language of the patient came across much more authentically to other women considering taking part in the trials. So I think within clinical trials, um, there's a number of groups that are certainly underrepresented and just demographically, uh, we see women, uh, particularly because uh, I think some sponsors have been hesitant that uh, you know people might be pregnant and so that could cause uh, additional complications. Um, I think there's some concerns around the age of menopause, what sort of hormonal interactions they might have uh, with, with new therapies. We also see that much older people are frequently excluded from clinical trials. So those are some of the, the obvious ones. Um, I think in terms of uh, black and ethnic minority populations, they may be uh, sort of underrepresented in trials for at least two reasons. One is that uh, they may end up excluded from some of the exclusion criteria. So for example, uh, in the United States, African Americans are at a higher rate of risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Those are frequently exclusion criteria for trials. The other thing to think about is some of the historical and cultural issues. We have things like the Tuskegee syphilis study in America or the story of Henrietta Lacks that I think have been the basis for a lot of mistrust. And then finally, a lot of the um, structural aspects of a trial that require you to take a lot of time of work or travel long distances or sort of give up caregiving responsibilities, I think fall particularly hard uh, on those who don't have as much social capital, say. And so this is why we do see in research as well as in specialist clinical centers as well as in trials, it tends to be more educated, more wealthy, more white uh, patients taking part in studies. And as a consequence, that limits the generalizability of those findings. So I think technology has been really transformative just because it allows scale. So from my own experience, uh, for my PhD nearly 20 years ago, I would go and see patients with motor neuron disease in their homes one at a time. And obviously that was a very intimate and, and personal experience, but it certainly didn't scale. We then set up an online virtual community for those patients at King's College Hospital and very quickly grew to three or 400 patients all interacting at once. And of course the advantage was if it took them an hour to type out a sentence, they could take that hour. You know, if they were overwhelmed or upset by seeing other patients in a more advanced state of disease, perhaps with a feeding tube or a respirator, they didn't necessarily have to see that and they could project their own sort of avatar of how they wanted to be considered um, by other patients. And then it just becomes a, a case of statistical power. You know, if you're able to rapidly get views from four or 500 people, that's more convincing, that's more persuasive than just one anecdotal story. Because a lot of skeptical people, particularly in the trials world, which is very quantitative, will say to you, you know, the plural of anecdote is not data. 
So I think we can actually work on both the quantitative and the qualitative, so the quantitative to understand what's going on and the qualitative to understand why and what we can do about it. So I think increasingly there's acknowledgement that patients are the experts in the lived experience of their condition. So if you are being treated by, say, a neurologist for your Parkinson's disease, you will see that neurologist for about two hours a year, at most. And the rest of the time you're learning uh, from you know, how your treatments work and uh, you know, perhaps you're tracking with devices like wearables or, or smartphone apps that are increasingly uh, available to you and released by nonprofits like the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, I think we're increasingly going to see that uh, a subset of patients at least are going to be coming to their clinicians with a view of the data. Um, and I think it's increasingly easy for those groups to sort of form online and actually build tools themselves. Um, I do wonder if there's the opportunity for people that work in the data space in the clinical trial world to actually offer some of those tools, you know, to offer a data commons so that perhaps you know, people with a different disease could upload you know, photographs or uh, Fitbits or smartphone data or even allow access to their social media so that when a trial opportunity arises they can be informed about it sooner but also that we have kind of lead-in data perhaps on what was happening before they started in a clinical trial. Obviously right now it's going to be messy, it's going to be imperfect, there's going to be interoperability problems but I think again we need to think about this over the next 10-20 years and I think we can all envisage a future where that seems like a part of the fabric of life. The question is could we make that 17 years, 12 years, 8 years, tomorrow?